Hey guys, welcome to our chapel. Let's do the best we can to focus our hearts on God in this moment. And the Lord be with you. I, um, I was asked to do prayers for the world today, and I was asked to do something a little different. Usually when we do prayers for the world, we talk about something big going on somewhere. Um, I'm not going to do that. Instead, I'm going to start with a little show and tell. Um, this is a leaf. I stepped over probably a thousand of them on the way to school this morning, and then I went back out and found one that I really liked. Um, I like the color. I, I like that if you look closely, you can't see it, can you? No, sorry. Um, I like that if you look closely at it, every little vein is a slightly different color. It's got a beautiful texture, and I love the waxy feel of the leaf. You have to pick them up to feel that. So I like my leaf. Uh, this is a stone. You can't see this either, can you? Yes, wow, thank you. Um, but it's a fun, there's, there's, this is actually a special stone to me. I was backpacking with two friends on North Manitou Island a couple summers ago, and we were in awe of this amazing view as we watched on, walked on the shore, and uh, there was South Manitou in the distance, and beyond that, you know, more beauty. And I happened to glance down and see this very plain, pale stone, but for some reason I picked it up, and it turns out it's a Petoskey stone. Yeah, and, and my, my two friends I was with on that trip had been looking for Petoskey stones, and I just looked down and there it was. It was, it was a wonderful little moment. Um, and so I keep it on my, on my dresser, and some days I put it in my pocket and I take it to school, and when if, if I'm nervous or, or thinking about something, it's a little worry stone. I don't know if you've ever heard of that tradition, the worry stone that you rub your finger on. Um, why am I telling you about these? Well, I, I got to hear Tony Campalo speak several years ago. He was an excellent keynote at a CEA convention. Um, and he told a story about, uh, Tony Campalo is, is a minister and a sociologist who works at Eastern University, which is a Christian college in Philadelphia. And one day he was in his suit going to some important meeting, walking through Philadelphia, and a homeless guy in rags, unwashed, unshaven, uh, came up to him and said, hey, mister. Tony Campalo did what most of us do. You're trying to be polite, but you're also trying to, you know, walk fast. And the guy said, no, hey, mister, come here. So he did. And the guy said, you want a sip of my coffee? Yes, I see some facial expressions which probably ma like mirror Tony. Like, this guy has probably not brushed his teeth in a month. He's been sipping on the coffee. He wants me to sip his coffee. That's disgusting. But he took it, <laughs> and he took a little sip of the coffee, and he gave it back to the guy. And he thought the guy was going to ask him for money, because that's what you expect homeless people to do. But the guy didn't. And so Tony Campalo kind of gave him the opening and said, so, um... Why did you want to share your coffee with me? And the guy said, The coffee is so good today. And I believe when God gives you something good, you have to share it. Would you give me a hug? And he did. Kind of gross. Here's the cool thing, though. Um, we often talk about big things. You stand on a mountain and you look at a thousand trees blazing red and it's gorgeous. Or you, uh, you look at that mountain, it's just a big rock and it's gorgeous. But God, the God who made this huge universe sustains every atom of this universe. And so everything in between the subatomic particles and the largest galaxy is still God's. And he puts it in this world to call you to him and show you himself. So uh, this morning I stepped over a thousand leaves, each beautiful. On the way into school this morning I passed a dozens of you. And I apologize if I didn't stop and say good morning and treat you like the image bearer of God that you are. Our prayer for the world this morning is a prayer of gratitude 
that God can minister to us in the smallest things. So if your coffee was good this morning, or if there was enough milk to pour on your favorite cereal this morning, or if the sweatshirt you really wanted to wear just happened to be clean today and not in that pile in the corner of your room, if a friend stopped and said, hey, good morning, and really meant it today, those are little ways God has approached you today. Um, I have a, a Mother Teresa quote. She says this, to the good God, nothing is little because he is great, so great, and we are so small. That is why he stoops down and takes the trouble to make all of these little things for us. Will you join me, please, in our prayer for the world? God, we know you to be the maker of this universe. We know you to be calling us towards yourself at all times. Give us the eyes to see you, Lord, not only in the big, grand things of the world, but in small events, because we know that you are the God of the still, small voice. You are the God who came to us in a manger, in a cave, and an out of the world, or out of the uh, unimportant corner of the world um, when you could have walked right into the biggest palace. Um, help us to see you in everything. We pray this in your name. Music. Hey, I'm excited today. I'm very excited. Can I just say, uh, God is good? Let's do that again. God is good? All the time? Good. Hey, I just want to, um, before I introduce our guest speaker, I know a lot of us are in, in different places in terms of our spiritual life and our spiritual walk, um, where we are with our faith. But I'm just here to remind you that God is good and He does miracles. I mean, anytime you can turn water to wine and open the eyes of the blind and walk on water and the resurrection. So I, I think it's, it's important throughout our journey to hear various testimonies, how God has really kind of showed up and showed out in people's life and delivered them from things that maybe they shouldn't have been delivered. And how often do we often say, Oh, thank God. Or, God, if you can only help me in this moment. I was, I was riding my bike this, uh, was this Saturday. I think this Saturday, real bad accident um, on 60th and Wing out in the uh, Gaines Township area. And a bunch of paramedics, they had to uh, cut the doors off. And as I'm just kind of sitting there, I'm riding my bike, so I stop just to kind of take a look and see what's going on. So a guy comes up, and he just says, you know, he said, man. It's unbelievable that God really saved them because there's no way that they could have came through that accident without being killed. I mean, it was, it was really bad. But anyways, um, I have the privilege to introduce a friend of mine. We, we worship together. And I, I just truly believe that God does miracles. I mean, a, a year ago, I was, I was in a, a difficult situation. My wife was diagnosed with breast cancer. And God delivered her. And now she's, she's uh, cancer-free. So not only do I see how God's working in my life, but also I think it's important to see how God is working in other people's lives when they tell their testimony. So Hans is a friend of mine. He graduated from Ferris State. Um, as I said, we, we worship together. He's had the opportunity to write a book. He has a nonprofit organization, ACARE Human Services, which is a nonprofit organization. Um, and they do a lot of work back in, 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 in West Africa. Hans is actually from Liberia. And he, he told his testimony in church some time ago. And I just, you know, if you ever thought that, man, I'm really struggling with my faith. But just to hear his story and how powerful it is, um, as Mr. Quist said earlier, I just open your eyes, open your hearts, open your minds to receive his word today. And without any further ado, I'd like to present to us Hans Gipley. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. What a beautiful crowd. A big one, too. You know, when I walked down the stairs, I only saw this area, but then when I came up here, I saw that I got overwhelmed. It's a privilege to be here this morning. Um, 
grace and gratitude. Let me tell you about a story of, of a seven-year-old that, that showed his gratitude to God. It was about this time of the year, and he was in a good kid in school. So his mom told him, you know what, the bike that you wanted, you will never get it. And he sat down one morning on a weekend watching a prosperity preacher preach the word and telling you that you can get anything you want, just ask God. And this seven-year-old looked around, you know, his mom is in the kitchen making some breakfast or whatever, and he went into the room, he knelt down, he said, God, please, I need a bike. I want it to be red. Very nice bike. In Jesus' name, amen. And I want it to be available tomorrow morning at my doorsteps. He woke up the next morning, the first thing he did was to check his doorsteps. And he went back in, he said, God, I talked to you yesterday, and I told you I wanted a bike. I told you I wanted it to be red, and it's not here today. However, I'm giving you one more chance. I need a bike, please, in Jesus' name, amen. The next morning, he woke up, and there was no bike. So he walked into his house, and all of a sudden, he saw a little statue of Mary sitting in the corner on top of the dresser. His mom wasn't looking at him. The seven-year-old walked to the statue, took it, and put it in his pocket, and walked into the room and hid it underneath the bed. And he went and he knelt down again. He said, God, if you want to see your mother again. <laughs> so it's amazing, you know, how little kids think and how the older people think. Today, I'm here with a generation I have so much given to them. Like you said, my name is Hans. I'm from Liberia. And uh, it's a privilege to be here this morning. I see you have a great opportunity to be in such a school. Even it's a great opportunity to be in America. Sometimes you never know what you have until you lose it. And uh, this happened to me in 1989. I was a normal kid, like any other kid raised in Africa. You know, half a little bit, not too much, but not struggling. Woke up one morning, getting ready for school. We had to head down to fetch water from the well and then come back home. You know, like any other African kid, you do your chores, getting waken up by the rooster crow, and going down to the well, getting the water, and doing everything you have to do before you go to school. However, most of them will walk miles to school, three miles, 10 miles, some even 15 miles. Some will have to start their journey almost an hour before they get to school. I was privileged enough to live close back to Sewell. On our way from the well back to the house, things were never the same. November of 1989, it was something different that happened. There was a civil war broke out, rebels attacked, and everywhere was never the same. Bloodshed everywhere. When we were coming back from, from the well, you know, when we heard, we thought it was something like a, a, a fireworks happening. But as we came closer to our homes and to our houses, it was something different. We saw young guys, our age group, and some older guys dressed up with red bandana tied to their heads in baggy jeans with AK-47, shooting everything that come through their path. That money was never the same. Most of us got to our homes with nobody at home. Parents left homes going to find children that left house very early to do chores, and it was chaos everywhere. And that was the beginning of that morning, and it didn't stop. That went on for almost 15 years, but I'm just gonna tell you about the first few days. When we got home, we met 
few people running around all over the place. Everyone is confused. The first instance, based on this attack, we all had to run into a cocoa farm that was very unkept in, at the edge of the town. And meeting people there, and we, and we hide in that cocoa farm, watching people running towards us, parents, children, getting shot at. Many of them did not make it into that cocoa farm. Some of them made it into the cocoa farm, riddled with bullets, and died right into that cocoa farm. At that time, I was about nine, 10 years old, and uh, my uncle came, came running with my siblings into that farm. However, that very same day, I lost my little brother because he was in a house where the family was hiding out when the rocket hit the house. 14 family members died on the scene, and he was one of those that died. After that point, we started to move out into places. The first place we decided to escape to, and we thought it was the safest place, was an assembly of God church that was a few miles down the road. And when we got into the church, we were in that church for about a week. I thought it was the safest place. Growing up, parents telling me about what God is, what Jesus was. He protected you from everything. So we thought the protection, I personally felt the protection was in this church. One week later, that church was attacked and many people got slaughtered. We escaped from that church, ended up somewhere in the swamp, didn't even know the amount of people that got slaughtered until we left that swamp 72 hours later and found out that 60% of the people in that church did not make it out. Now, family member went into the church trying to find their loved ones, and it wasn't a good scene you got bodies laying out on the pulpits, body parts laying between the pews. And from that day on, I personally, being a 10-year-old, felt like, you know, God didn't exist. You know, if God really exists, why would he allow anybody to go through anything like this? And that wasn't just the end of it. You know, it was just the beginning. Now we have to escape out of town. We had to go places. We're trying to escape out of town, going places where there was no war fighting, but it was everywhere. We started a journey leaving town, and you could see the most gruesome scene. Some of you have watched Hotel Rwanda. Some of you have watched some of the, the, the TV show Blood Diamonds and everything. It was no different from that except it's a little bit more modified because it's Hollywood. So this was very gruesome to the point that when we leave, anytime we leave a location, you can have 5,000 people walking to the next town to seek safety, and probably only 200 to 500 people made, made it there. We had to go through so many checkpoints. At the checkpoints, young girls get taken away for sex slaves, Young boys get taken away from their parents for, as child soldiers, and older men get killed because they serve in the government somehow. So 10,000 people could start a journey from here to Detroit, and only 500 people made it there days or weeks later. And this not just from people getting slaughtered by the rebels or by the army, some people getting hit by stray bullets. Some people cannot make it. They get towed in a wheelbarrow until they finally die from starvation. So in all this situation, I personally, at this point, never believed that there was anybody called God exist from what I have been taught growing up as a Pentecostal child. You know, a assemblies of God, church, worship, and everything. We were fortunate enough and made it out of there by the United Nations. They took us over a nearby country called the Ivory Coast, which also had their own problem not too long ago. 
You know, at that point, Africa, West Africa was completely unstable. It's like what you see in the Arab Spring today. You know, the early 90s was what everything that was going on around West Africa. So as we got into the refugee camps, across the border, we thought it was fine. But the war had just begun. Now you ran away from a stray bullet, you ran away from getting killed, you ran away from, you know, starvation. Now you're on a refugee camp, living in tents, and you think it's all free, you know, you think you're all free. And then the next thing, you know, cholera hit. Cholera is a, 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 a intestinal disease that causes diarrhea, and it makes you to go until you lose, until you deplete everything in your body, and finally, you know, die in 24 hours if it is not addressed. You know, cholera hit a refugee camp. Up to 40% of the population on a refugee camp is gone within the first 24 hours. I have seen family bury entire family. I know a neighbor who buried his two sons, three daughters, by five o'clock in the afternoon, he buried his wife, and from that cemetery he said, I am not going back to that tent and be killed by the disease that take away my whole family. I would rather be killed by a bullet. And right then from that cemetery, he started to walk across the border back to Liberia. So life on a refugee camp was never that easy. We lived on a refugee camp from 1990. I was there from 1990 all the way to 1999, doing everything we can to survive. And then one day, a group from Michigan came from the Lutheran Christian Services. They came and decided to set up a program called the Reconciliation Program. Oh yeah, we're gonna set up a reconciliation program, we're gonna work with the United Nations, and we're gonna bring people together, and they're gonna talk about their problems, you know, and they will get better. So however, you know, nobody wanted to deal with it, and they recruited some of the young guys to do the work. And I'm 15 years old then, I needed some money, so I said, oh yeah, I'll be one of the recruiters. Even though I don't believe in what you guys are trying to do, and then the recruitment process starts. We started going from door to door, knocking on people's doors, waking up people out of their tent, letting them know about the process, and letting them know, hey, if you come, there will be food available. People starving, they wanted food, so they came. The first meeting was a crowd of 500 people or more, and this lady asked a question and the room was completely silent. I, can, I still remember, this still echoes in my ear. This lady stood up and she raised a song called By the Rivers of Babylon. It's an old school song, probably you guys haven't heard of it. And she sang that song right at the end of the song and she started to explain what happened to her. How she was raped, had to kill her husband in front of her, and later on, she was let go after she got raped several times, but she needed peace and she needed healing. And right after that, people started to stand up to give their testimony. A friend of mine who was helping me to bring those people into this gathering, he stood up and gave his testimony every day he go check in the Red Cross bulletin board to see if any of his family members were a new arrival. Because he was all by himself, didn't know where his parents were, didn't know where his siblings were. He explained all of that. The next person stood up, everybody, one after the other. People stood up and even gave him their testimony, and people that harmed them, some of the rebels were among those groups because they themselves have fled to safety. As I speak to this, some of them even live in Grand Rapids that we know personally. We live among them, and everyone have their own reason to do what they did. 
And it was through this group I was able to see how merciful, how graceful God is. And I decided to go back into the things of God at the age of 15, and my life began to change, transform, and we started to evangelize around the refugee camp. There were a lot of hurting people. And one day, God was able to open my way. The Red Cross were able to locate my parents in the United States, and that's how they were able to sponsor us for us to come 1999, February of 1999. So the mercy of God has been very merciful. I see many people, we all have, like Brother Eric said, we all go through, we are on a different level of faith. It's the same, we are on different level of life. My story is not your story, but I believe everyone in this room has a story. They have a struggle. Even Jesus Christ had his struggle because he came God in flesh to rescue mankind unto him. Because when I got to America and I thought everything was over, I decided to go into healthcare because the suffering that I saw, you know, and the suffering that I experienced. I've been a registered nurse now for 15 years, and those 15 years have been happy years, have been good years. I worked last night, and I'm going to be working a 12-hour shift tonight. Every time you walk into the hospital, you see suffering. All these big hospitals here, every time I walk through the door, I have the privilege to do agency nursing. So my agency called me, hey, Hans, see Mary's need help tonight. Okay, I'm open, I'm going to go. Hey, Spectrum need help tonight. And I have worked in every single hospital in Grand Rapids. Prior to that, I work at almost every single hospital in Boston. Prior to that, I work at every single hospital in Phoenix, Arizona. And now I'm here working at every single hospital. And every time I walk through those doors, I see people suffer, and yet everyone seek the mercy and the grace of God. So pain is everywhere. Your pain may be different this morning. Your pain may be something you're dealing with personally and nobody knows. So much pain is everywhere in this world tonight, today, but God actually has a way to heal people. The healing grace is always there. Now, a very touching story about a girl that I came across last night. I can't mention a hospital because of confidentiality reason. A nine-year-old girl that have a disease called SIPA the inability to feel pain. Sometimes we think pain is bad. But this girl was born with the inability to feel pain, and now, today, she's going to be transferred to the University of Michigan because they can, the hospitals in this area cannot handle that problem. It's a very rare condition and a very rare disease that happens in probably 1% to 2% of the population. Because this girl has the inability to feel pain, this nine-year-old from the day she was born, her parents or the caretaker has to follow her everywhere she goes. Because she can put her hand on a hot stove and don't even feel it, that her hand is on a hot stove. Her hand can get chopped off, her leg can get chopped off while she's on the playing ground, and she won't even know that her hand is not there because she doesn't have the ability to feel pain. On top of it, she just got diagnosed with leukemia, and you see her parents are bawling their eyes out, crying for their little girl, and she look at them and tell them, she said, it's going to be all right, daddy. And then yet, we are here today. We are privileged to be able to walk. 50% of the people that I may take care of tonight cannot breathe on their own. 
they are unbreathing machines. But yet the grace of God is there. So my struggle in Africa is no different from the struggle of those people in these hospitals and it's no different from the struggle that you go through today in your personal life. But in every situation, God is always there. I was going through some of the literature and there is a lady called Anne Johnson Flint. In the 1920s, uh, 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 Anne Johnson Flint was a lady who lost her parents and got adopted and then she lost her adopted parents and later on got diagnosed with arthritis and ended up in a wheelchair. And because she was bedridden, she had souls everywhere. But Anne Johnson Flynn ended up becoming one of the best poet writer that the world had ever seen. And all her poet, all the portraits she wrote were all about grace and mercy of God. Today we have eyes and we can see physically, but there is a lady called Kelly who was blind from birth and she became one of the best songwriters. And they asked her what so much has she experienced about her blindness that people with sight have never experienced. And one thing she said, she said the worst thing to have sight is to have sight and not be able to see, a sight without a vision. So out of the troubles and out of the difficulties of everything, these people were able to emerge because of the grace of God. You know, I'm 35 years old now, and I will tell you half of my life I have seen a whole lot. And at some point, I said, you know what? I give up. This is the norm of life. And God promised to be with us in every situation that we find ourselves in. You know, this is what Jesus did. Now, Jesus is God in flesh. He came to rescue men back unto him. In Matthew 26, verse 38. Few minutes before he head to the cross, he was in so much pain and so much disappointment. And this is what he told his disciples. He said, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here with me and watch with me. That was the time they went into the Garden of Gethsemane. He was preparing to go to the cross. He knew what he was going to encounter as he headed to the cross. But he knew the will that he came here for had to be accomplished. So no pain can stop you from doing what God has sent you here to accomplish. I see a lot of great potential in here today. A great potential that means a lot to your generation. And when Jesus went to that cross, he defeated death and he brought us back unto the Father. And this is what he said in John 16, verse 32 to 33. At the and he told his disciples, he said, a time is coming and in fact has come when you will be scattered each into your own home. You will leave me alone. Now, this is somebody that is about to go through so many pain, and he knows that he's going to be abandoned by the people that is closer to him the most. But then he went on to say, yet I am not alone, for my father is with me. He said, even though you guys will leave me alone, the time is coming and the moment is coming, but yet I will not be alone. And that was a metaphor to tell us today that even though we can be in our struggle and we think we are alone, 
but yet we are not alone. God is always there with us. He did not promise us paradise. He did not promise us that life will always be perfect. Because he went on to say, I have told you these things so that in me you will have peace. In this world you will have trouble. He made it very clear that in this world you will have trouble, but in him, in this world, you will have peace. So there will always be trouble, but once you stay in Jesus Christ, like some of the songs that you sang today, this morning, that in him is everything you have. Once you stay in him, you will always have peace. He went on to say, but take heart, I have overcome the world. John 16, 32 to 33. So my dear friends, fellow brothers and sisters, all I can say as I drove coming up here, I drove by a cemetery. I hate to tell you this. I didn't plan to say this, but as I drove by that cemetery, I saw only one thing people that have gone home or gone ahead of us. But people have always thought that the richest place on earth was the diamond mines of South Africa or Alaska or the oil mines of Iran or Iraq or Texas, but that is never true. The richest place on earth that you can go and mine and get everything out of it is the cemetery. Why is the cemetery? I tell people because there are a lot of people that went into that cemetery without accomplishing their potential because they were